The Supreme Federal Court of Brazil resumed an inquiry into a fake news network this Wednesday, while the Senate passed an emergency law set to severely impact workers. The President of the European Commission has said that it is time to talk about racism openly and honestly. An extraordinary China-Africa summit took place this Wednesday on solidarity against COVID-19. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, and I'm Katrina Goss. The Supreme Federal Court of Brazil resumed an inquiry into a fake news network this Wednesday. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Mir, brings us more details. Today, the Brazilian Senate passed an emergency law enabling employers and small business owners to cut the hours of their staff and temporarily reduce their salaries by 75, 50 or 25 percent during the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, a Supreme Court inquiry into a fake news network run by allies of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro is deepening. Today, Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes ruled to continue the investigation and to unlock bank account information of 11 Congress people who are part of Bolsonaro's governing coalition. The people involved in this fake news network are being accused of making online threats, including rape of family members and assassination of Brazil's Supreme Court ministers. Sarah Winter, who is one of the leaders of an anti-Supreme Court movement that shot fireworks at the Supreme Court last week during a protest, is already in jail. The investigation is deepening and it's getting closer and closer to far-right President Jair Bolsonaro and his family members. And as our correspondent Brian May mentioned, this Wednesday the Brazilian Senate passed an emergency law set to severely impact workers during the pandemic. The law, which will be submitted to presidential approval, authorises the suspension of work contracts for up to 60 days and enables employers to cut staff hours and temporarily reduce sal salaries by up to 75%. It was unanimously approved by the plenary session of the Senate. An amendment to the bill prohibited companies from charging states and municipalities for termination costs. Also, officials who receive a pension will not be entitled to receive unemployment insurance payments. The law is expected to be in force until the end of this year. Chile has become a major hotspot of the coronavirus pandemic, which continues to hit the Latin American region hard. Chilean authorities have now reported over 184,000 COVID-19 cases. The country ranks first in South America in terms of the number of cases per 1 million people at over 9,500. The country's health system is overwhelmed. The number of cases began to rise when the government announced the so-called new normality, which has hit the poorest and most populated areas of the capital hardest, as the sectors who have no option but to go out to earn a living, thus exposing themselves to infection. Bolivia's de facto president, Janine Añez, has revealed her intention to delay the country's elections in an effort to remain in power. On Tuesday, Agnes raised the possibility of postponing the vote by two months, arguing that there was a risk of infection from the novel coronavirus. Meanwhile, the coup regime is ramping up its campaign against the movement towards Socialism Party, which polls show is the favourite to win the September 6 elections. And the Supreme Electoral Tribunal of Bolivia has complied with instructions from the Attorney General's office to accuse the movement towards Socialism Party and former electoral authorities of electoral fraud in October last year. Our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, brings us the details. The State Attorney General sent three threatening letters and public demands for the Electoral Court to be constituted as an accusing part against the movement to Socialism and members of the former Electoral Court. However, to this day, the president, who is the highest executive authority of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, Dr. Salvador Romero Vallivian, has not been constituted as a plaintiff or active procedural subject. On Monday, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal finally announced in a statement that it is joining the judicial process, the strategy of the authorities of the de facto government and its political grouping together, which is running as a candidate, Yenin Añez, is to annul the legal status of the mass and so to avoid its participation in September's elections.
We are going to continue to insist that the Supreme Electoral Court comply with the law because the law states that if fraud is committed, the party that benefits from the fraud loses its legal personality. That is what we are demanding from the President of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal. The movement to socialism maintains the first place in the vote preference surveys for the planned election for next September, while the candidate Janine Agnes is debated between the third and fourth place of a total of eight candidates. Agnes maintains a strong opposition to the election being held on that date, on the pretext of the increase of coronavirus cases in the country. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. Peru's health minister has claimed that COVID-19 fatalities are falling. To date, Peru has reported over 200,000 confirmed cases, ranking eighth in the world. The country has been under a nationwide mandatory lockdown for three months. The death rate in Peru is dropping. It's falling, slowly but surely. In terms of infection, our epidemic is slowing down. The number of cases used to double every seven days. Today, it is every 15 days, and in some regions, every 20 days, which means the speed of infection has slowed down. In most of the country's regions, and in many provinces, and in some places, even in the country, a significant number of districts don't have any cases. In Colombia, a group of pilots have delivered medical supplies to the country's most remote regions to combat COVID-19. Fifty volunteers from the Aero Club the Columbia Aviation Training Institute carry out daily humanitarian flights, transporting government-provided medical supplies and occasionally health care personnel. They depart from an airport in Bogota to distant areas, stretching from the department of Choco to the Amazonian region. More stories coming up after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has said that it is time to talk about racism openly and honestly in the midst of ongoing protests sparked by the police murder of George Floyd. And let us look around here in this very hemicycle. The diversity of our society is not represented, and I will be the first to admit things are not better in the College of Commissioners or among the European Commission staff. And this is why I say we need to talk about racism and we need to act. It is always possible to change direction if there is a will to do so. The United Nations ele is electing five non-permanent members of the Security Council for the 2021-2022 term this Wednesday. Special voting arrangements have been made at the UN headquarters due to COVID-19-related restrictions. Seven countries are vying for the spots, Mexico, India, Kenya, Djibouti, Canada, Ireland and Norway. The 193-member group is also holding elections for the president of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly and members of the Economic and Social Council. English singer-songwriter Roger Waters also joined the campaign against Canada's bid for the Security Council, saying that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government has an unacceptable record regarding respect for Indigenous peoples at home. I've been looking at the piece in the Toronto Star, the big debate about whether or not uh, Canada should be invited to become a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And... Uh, we're going to have to come to some conclusion about that. My vote would be no on the following grounds. That, one, the Trudeau government does not represent the feelings of the Canadian people. Um, it, consistently, they uh, follow policies, particularly in terms of the Zionist policies of the uh, Canadian uh, government that the Canadian people do not subscribe to. Um, they're determined to allow the continued <clears throat> raping of the wet Wetsuwet'en land, digging dirty oil and spreading it all around the world um, against the wishes of most of the people because they are following the tried and tested model of a government that represents corporations and not people. 
One of Spain's most visited monuments, the Alhambra Palace, has reopened its doors after a three-month closure due to the coronavirus. With travel regulations still in place until June 21st, only locals were able to visit the site, which is one of the world's largest open-air museums of Islamic architecture. From July 1st, borders will be open to all international visitors, although strict security measures will remain in place. This includes the mandatory use of masks, hand sanitizer, and the observance of social distancing rules. Today we can open with all the safety warranties. We are at 50% of our capacity for visits because we are in a phase three, with all the measures set by health authorities to guarantee both the safety of our workers and the safety of the people who are going to visit us from now on. This is fundamental for us. Germany has placed more than 300 Berlin households under quarantine after 57 people tested positive for COVID-19. The residents of seven different apartment buildings are not allowed to leave their homes for 14 days. The lockdown follows the launch of Germany's coronavirus tracking app. Experts say finding new cases quickly is key to clamping down on fresh clusters, especially at a time when European countries are lifting lockdown restrictions and opening their borders. Italy has reopened high schools across the country for 35,000 students to take final oral exams in person rather than virtually. The Academic Commission will hold five oral exams a day, lasting one hour each, with a 15-minute break between to disinfect the areas. Classes will not officially resume until September. The government implemented a national lockdown on March 5th after the novel coronavirus began to spread rapidly through the north of the country, but the measures are gradually being lifted. China has called for a peace agreement with India to resolve the border conflict over the strategically important Galwan River Valley in the Himalayas. According to local media, on Monday night, 20 Indian troops were killed following a clash with Chinese forces. After the incident, both China and India expressed their commitment to resolving their divergence through dialogue and safeguarding peace and tranquility in the border areas. As the two largest developing countries and emerging economies in the world, the common interests of China and India far outweigh their divergence. The two countries should earnestly follow the important consensus reached between the leadership of the two countries and ensure that China-India relations move in the right direction in the line with the interests and expectations of the people of the two countries. We hope that India will work with China and make joint effort in this direction. And we're taking one last very short break now, so stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. Chinese President Xi Jinping chaired an extraordinary China-Africa summit on solidarity against COVID-19 in Beijing this Wednesday. The summit, held via video link, saw the participation of African heads of state and government and representatives of different organizations, including the UN Secretary General and the Director General of the World Health Organization. At the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Beijing Summit, we agreed to work together to build an even stronger China-Africa community with a shared future. Today's extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19 is a concrete step to deliver the commitment we made at the Beijing Summit and to do our part in the international cooperation against COVID-19. I'm convinced that humanity will ultimately defeat the virus and that the Chinese and African people are poised to embrace better days ahead. I want to take this opportunity to join my colleagues to thank you, President Xi, and through you, the government of China and the people of China for the swift response to provide Kenya and indeed the rest of our continent with medical supplies, including testing kits, personal protective equipment, pharmaceuticals, all to help us fight, not just in Kenya's case, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the locust invasion that we recently had. 
Over 20,000 people have been evacuated after mudslides caused by major flooding in China's Xinjiang province. Local authorities say 14 people were successfully rescued, while two are still missing. A video filmed in the north condemned the, va the f A video showed some of the mudslides blocking roads. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea announced on Wednesday that it would soon redeploy soldiers to the previously demilitarized Kaesong Industrial Zone and the Mount Kumgang areas. According to a military spokesman, civil police posts will be set up again to strengthen the guard on the front line. These posts had been withdrawn from the demilitarized zone under the inter-Korean military agreement signed in 2018. Under the detailed military action plans to be approved by the Central Military Commission of the Workers' Party of Korea, units will be deployed at the two stations located in areas bordering South Korea. Tensions between the two Koreas have mounted since the North condemned the failure of the South to prevent propaganda leaflets from being dropped into its territory. The UN Refugee Agency has relocated over 30,000 Nigerians who fled into neighboring Niger following a rise in attacks by militias. Niger's Maradi region has become a temporary shelter for Nigerian refugees displaced by armed groups. Despite border closures due to COVID-19 restrictions, refugees have been allowed to enter Niger to receive aid and basic health care. The insecurity at the border and influx of refugees has further displaced 23,000 Nigerians in their own country. In the border villages, the host villages, we could not ensure the protection of these people. The management of protection cases, the follow-up of children, the follow-up of women, all of the aspects of protection. It was really very difficult. Here in the villages of opportunity, it will be really very easy with all the partners who are already working on the sites. Mali's President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita has said leading opposition leader Soumaila Sisi, who was kidnapped days before the country's parliamentary elections in March, is alive. Last month, Sisi's family warned the government is moving too slow in securing the release of Sisi, a runner-up in a 2018 presidential election and president of the Union for the Republic and Democracy Party. Unidentified gunman seized Sisi on March 25th while he was campaigning in the Timbuktu region ahead of the May 29th vote. Despite the conflict raging for years in Mali, Sisi's abduction was the first of a politician of his rank. Mali has been struggling to contain an armed campaign that began as a localized revolt in the country's north in 2012 before spreading to the center of the country and then to neighboring Niger and Burkina Faso. Sumaila Sisi is one of the insiders of Malian politics. Malawi's main opposition leader, Lazarus Chakwera, is confident of his chances of victory in the upcoming presidential elections. The country's constitutional court ordered a rerun of last year's polls following mass protests over irregularities in the initial vote. And this time around, we have more confidence that uh, this election will be treated with the integrity it deserves because it expresses the will of Malawians. Malawians must be respected. Their rights must be respected. It is not a matter of who counts the vote. It should be a matter of uh, every vote counting. The United States imposed its harshest sanctions yet against Syria on Wednesday to prevent President Bashar al-Assad from achieving a military victory. The new travel restrictions and financial sanctions authorize a freeze on the assets of anyone dealing with Syria, regardless of nationality, and cover many more sectors. The sanctions also target those dealing with entities from Russia and Iran. The unilateral measures were imposed under an executive order and the so-called CISA Syria Civilian Protection Act. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the new steps were the start of a sustained campaign of economic and political pressure against Pres President Assad and vowed more in the coming weeks. Russia, China and Syria have strongly condemned the move, which comes in the face of the Syrian government's advances against U.S.-backed terrorists and at a time when the country is facing a severe economic crisis. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellyserenglish.net. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellyser English, I'm Katrina Goss, and thank you for watching.